So what's the main message here from fruit flies and butterflies? And the main message is that new patterns evolve when old genes learn new tricks. Very old genes. The gene I just showed you we know is more than 500 million years old and possessed by most members of the animal kingdom. It has some very old jobs in, for example, building appendages. But it's taken on a new task in these butterflies in terms of patterning these eye spots. So a lot of the diversities we see is not so much due to new genes, it's due to new uses of the same old genes. Okay, like a, like a painter's palette, you don't necessarily need to invent new colors as much as you use colors in different ways. Okay, so how do they learn new tricks? How does a gene learn a new trick? And this is now going to connect with what you just learned about genetic switches in the stickleback case that David showed you. Well, those genetic switches govern how toolkit genes are used. It's mutations in the DNA sequence of those switches that change the function of those switches. And we can study these things by isolating these switches from different species and comparing how they operate. So when mutations occur in control switches, novelty arises, variation arises, and that's the material for evolution of form, evolution of novel spots, for example, in fruit flies and butterflies. So let me just show you this principle in a short animation. Let's compare two flies, one without spots, which is the humdrum Drosophila melanogaster, one with spots on the male, Drosophila biarmapes. There's a gene, we're just going to call it the paintbrush gene, that's coding sequence is shown here in yellow, the same sort of schematic arrangement that we showed you for the stickleback. Well, there are switches for this paintbrush gene that govern how it's used in the body. Well, both animals, genomes, contain these switches, and these switches govern the use of this paintbrush gene to fill in the color on the abdomen of the fruit fly. But in the spotted fruit fly, there's an additional switch, a switch that draws a spot in the wing, such that the paintbrush is also used, in addition to its other jobs, in drawing a spot on the wing of these butterflies, of these fruit flies, I'm sorry. Same principle is applying to butterflies. So what we understand here is the process of evolution involves both gain and loss. In the case of the spotted fruit flies, a new switch has evolved that draws a new pattern. It's expanded the role, expanded the number of jobs of a toolkit gene. In the case of the reduced pelvic sticklebacks, a job has been abandoned. The PIDX gene is no longer used for hind fin development in the species that have adapted to these lakes and lost their pelvic skeleton. The gene still exists and other switches still exist for that gene, but the switch has been inactivated in the sticklebacks. So this is the broad picture of evolution we get from understanding these switches and understanding how genes are used. Gains and losses are happening. Evolution is not a steadily progressive process. Pieces of genetic machinery, pieces of routines that are used in building animals are set aside or abandoned. Other new ones evolve. So whether we're talking about sticklebacks or butterflies or in fact virtually any other animal in the kingdom, the message is the same. Gains and losses are happening in the course of modification, of descent with modification. So when wondering where do these new tricks come from, we have to reinforce the message of yesterday. The animal does not conceive of this new trick. Mutations arise at random. That will create variation in form. Mutations and switches arising at random. Nature, either in the form of a, a mate or a predator, nature acts as the art critic that selects the better forms and patterns. So let's stop there and see if there's some questions before we move on. Yeah, in the green shirt. Yeah, you. Um, is the switch for the hind limbs in the stickleback and for the eye spots in the butterfly, is it turned off or is it um, deleted altogether? And if it's turned off, how? Okay, so there, uh, in the case of the switch, uh, let me just explain, for the butterfly, there's a new switch there, so it's turned on. In the case of the stickleback, the switch has been inactivated. I don't think we know yet at the level of detail you're asking whether it's been inactivated by a small number of changes or by large chunks missing. That's work that's in progress right as we speak. But it could be, and I know other cases of switches that have been inactivated by just a few changes in the DNA code, not complete erasure of the switch. Okay, so this ought to be exciting. Let's see if we still got an arm.
Oh, it's going right. Okay. Okay, right here in the uh, white shirt. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was just wondering earlier, you said that um, you had the two different flies listed, and you said that they were almost identical, but they're still different species because one had a different wing, like this, the <coughs> marking on the wing. But if it's only the males that show that, then is the, are the females of both those species the same? Well, they're not exactly the same. Uh, I can tell you that these species separated from a common ancestor 15 million years ago. I'm saying from the human vantage point, they're virtually the same. Uh, flies, for example, in their courtship rituals use lots of other cues in addition to this visual cue of extending the wings. They tap out a song, and the periodicity of that song is species specific. They also use pheromones. They, uh, they also don't necessarily inhabit the same um, habitat. So some flies will prefer rotting fruit, some will be on cactus, some will be on leaf litter, this sort of thing. So they are distinct species not for the re sole reason of the spots being different. They were distinct species a long time ago. Their lineages diverged a long time ago. And today, if co-mixed, there are so many different cues, the males of one species would have no success with the females of the other species, if that's what you're, you're driving at. We're going to have to move on, so just save some of those questions. And thanks for that one. So we're going to move to perhaps the, the question of questions, our species. What does all this talk of sticklebacks and butterflies and fruit flies and the fossil record and all that, what does that have to do with us? And I think you can appreciate that culturally this has been the thorny point. You may not know that Darwin really didn't deal with the question of human origins and the origin of species. He dodged it. He knew he had enough trouble coming. Uh, it was much later that he took up the, the issue of the origin of humans. But his foremost and most formidable ally, Thomas Henry Huxley, or T.H. Huxley, um, he didn't dodge it at all. And shortly after the origin of species, he wrote a book called Man's Place in Nature. Let me just read a brief passage. The question of questions for mankind, the problem which underlies all others and is more deeply interesting than any other, is the ascertainment of the place which man occupies in nature and of his relations to the universe of things. And the sketch at the bottom, you may have seen various forms of this, but that's the original frontispiece from Huxley's Man's Place in Nature. Huxley, like Darwin, had undertaken uh, a long voyage as a ship's naturalist. Unlike Darwin, Huxley grew up with very humble origins. He was a really up from the bootstrap sort of guy. He was a very intense man. He was a great scientist. He was a great anatomist, and he was a, a, quite an expert on both human anatomy and on ape anatomy. As apes started uh, arriving in England from Africa, Huxley was uh, one of the first to make lots of accurate descriptions of their skulls, their anatomy, et cetera, and understanding the relationship between apes and humans. So he took this matter of human origins head on, and soon, really almost in the same context, uh, time context as the origin of species, he had new material to think about, not just the great apes coming out of Africa and arriving in zoos or anatomy labs in England, he had fossils. So again, imagine the coincidence that David described to you the discovery of Archaeopteryx right after the origin of species. I described to you the discovery of mimicry by Henry uh, Walter Bates. Well. This fossil was dug up in 1856. It took a little while before scientists realized what it represented, but this is the original Neanderthal skull, the name, uh, the uh, specimen for which that species is named. This was discovered in the Neander Valley in Germany. At first, uh, it was unclear what it represented. The leading German anatomist of the time did not accept evolution and reasoned away this skull as the diseased remains of a soldier from the Napoleonic Wars. But this skull was found with some bones of Ice Age mammals, mammals that were, already, that were extinct. So it was quite clear that it was of ancient origin, and we were looking at an ancient hominid. Now, I'm not going to walk through the whole fossil record of human evolution, but I just want to highlight a few of the most remarkable fossils so you get some sense of what